This poem is called Twelve. One. At night, the moon pebbles light against her window, like a drunk admirer. She is pulled, her body a tide that rises. She is water, caught between. My daughter is coming to the gravity of a body not wholly her own anymore. She's drowning in it, lungs catching light like water, panic weaving an orbit around her. For the first time in her life, she can't see herself as anything but reflected light, as anything but alone. Two. When we were trying to conceive her, I read endless fairy tales of childless women who were instructed to catch two fertile fish and eat them by the river, dripping with moonlight, their bellies distended with food, bodies aching fullness and emptiness. Three. When boys come to puberty, it is their desire that defines them stains the sheets that their mothers wash and hang to dry in the sunlight. Imagine being defined by what you desire. Four. It's like watching an eclipse, the sudden erasure of everything she knew of the sky. People used to bang drums and pots, shout at the veiled light, try and frighten off the dragon swallowing the sun. Now we hold hands and watch the moon's dark shadow through pinhole cameras, a sun the size of a newborn's fingernail. Five. Maybe our bodies are more honest. Pain, deep within the recesses of her body, an ache she can't point to, blood without a wound. Six. Today on the internet, Me Too is trending, a billion women testifying to their harassments and assaults. I remember so keenly being 12, standing naked in front of the mirror, thinking, no one will desire me. This body will be hated and reviled. I was wrong and right. Seven. I am teaching her to fight. This, I tell her, is how to drive the soft bone of a man's nose into his brain. This is how to get an attacker off from a mount position. This is how to thread your keys between your knuckles when you walk. This is how, when confronted with a blade or gun, you leave your body. Eight. In fairy tales, the women supplicants find their children disguised as animals, or once a round, ripe melon. The mother is sanguine about a fat gourd as a daughter, sends her rolling past to lions and demons and men. The melon goes to school, teases her mother, tumbles about the town. This child, tight as a fist, every road unspooling before her. Nine, she is afraid to break down in public, in class after a test. Anxiety curls onto her chest like a cat, suckling her sweater, claws kneading her sadness. Eretaeus named the womb as an animal within an animal, a kind of wandering sorrow. She knows now that people are looking. She learns to fake a smile. 10. October, and on our walk home, the harvest moon is gold against the velvet sky. She talks and her words spin like a revolver in the hands of an old west gunslinger. When did she learn to bridle the night, to call in the sunset for her ride? 11. In the story, no one breaks the melon open. The daughter simply unfolds herself from the rind. A miracle, all she has escaped, how unbruised her flesh. Even in our stories, we can only imagine freedom as tucked inside a hard shell, as having escaped 
unbroken. 12. The moon edges closer, nudging your arm but looking away. A cat at the door it waxes and wanes, wanting in and out and howling at the existence of doors. Hold the screen open, let light trickle at your feet. Your daughter sleeps, her bones and dreams stretching like the horizon in its golden hour. All you can do is stay here, propping open this creaky door, letting her leave and come back to herself and to you. This poem is titled, In Order to Become Men, and it starts with an epigraph from Richard Harrison, and this reads, with the same tight mouth, and the young man and my son and I, all born helpless in order to become men, the way birds are born naked. So this poem is a glossa, which will use this epigraph within the poem itself. My son brandishes a sword at me, and we pretend to cut each other down, bloodless. He has already mastered the manly art of a stoic face as I lop off his arm. Now you say, I win, and if you want, you can say it in girl language. As if gender were geographies, north and south, and we didn't all speak the same clean tongue of violence. My son, we are the same throughout, with the same tight mouth, the same clenched heart like a fist holding its only coin. My combatives class is filled with men, paratroopers and prison guards and cops, who come to class and have to secure their handguns. I'm the only poet, but I get the same high. Once, after I was knocked down, the young instructor slung his arm round my neck, ground his knuckle into my hair. We were sweat slick and laughing and bleeding, and it was enough that I had tried. And the young man and my son and I knew in our bones that violence is a kind of fire that can solder men together or temper in the body like a blade, a thousand unseen cuts. What is it to raise a boy? I do want him to feel that power, to be knocked down and raised up again by his brothers, to limp away having spent every cell of his heart's blood rush. My son, the poetry of it is the moment on your back, the knowledge of us once again all born helpless in order to become men, and it is a miracle to become at all. Did I ever tell you about your father? How when he was 19, walking me home, both of us drunk, he brought me to his house and took my hands while I cried about my father, who was dying. He held my grief like it was sacred, and I saw then what kind of a man he would be, and you, I hope. Tenderness shot through his bones like marrow, like flight in a hatchling awakened, the way birds are born naked. This poem is called Quiver. We are made of stories. My daughter, the fertile field from the folk tale, where all day the family plowed and dressed the earth. And as midnight approached, a rooster sang out, and the soil rose like the wing of a bird, dipped in the wind, and turned over once more showed its grassy back and stones a million years old. Who are we but the breath of another, but the dust off the shoulders of the stars? She turns and turns again, and I don't know if she is field or air, stone or bird. A fox once said, tame me and I shall love to listen to the wind in the wheat but I love the quiver of a fox's nose, reading the dark tale of scent that shivers under fur tipped with frost, a russet stumble that my fingers can only imagine. Besides, she calls the birds, trembling from the sky, and holds them in her palm, feeds them the sunflower seeds from her pockets. 
She knows to keep seed in her pocket and pebbles, lip gloss, marbles, a safety pin. The family in the story wakes and they feel deceived. What was plowed is wild, no matter how many times their blades turn into the earth. The field is only ever itself, changing nightly.